Good morning to you, church. Uh, today is uh, Sunday. We want to give glory to God and thank God for a special day like today. Uh, let us pray. Lord Jesus, sometimes it is hard when those who seem undeserving are given as much as those who deserve the best. But Lord, we trust you to give each of us all that we need. And we offer ourselves in your service to give others all that we can. Father, we continuously thank you for what you do to us. We thank you, continuously thank you for your call. You have called us to be Christians. God has called us you have called strong and weak, the grateful and the grumblers, those who have much to give and those who have little. And he calls us, so some and worship the God, whose generosity is beyond words and whose love binds us all together. Be with us this morning, Father, as we are starting this service. In your name I pray. Amen. I'm going to call Brother Ben to come and read the Word of God from the book of Matthew, chapter 20, verses 1 to 16. Praise the Lord, and what a wonderful Sunday um, to be able to come and read the Word to you again. It's just such an such a honour to be able to do that. So, as Johnson mentioned, Matthew 20, 1 to 16. For the kingdom of heaven is like a land owner who went out in the morning to hire men to work in his vineyard. He agreed to pay them a denarius for the day and sent them into his vineyard. About the third hour, he went out and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. He told them, you also go and work in my vineyard and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. About the eleventh hour he went out and found still others standing around. He asked them, Why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? Because no one has hired us, they answered. He said to them, You also go work in my vineyard. When evening came, the, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. The workers who were hired about the eleventh hour came and each received a denarius. So when those came who were hired first, they expected to receive more. But each one of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they began to grumble against the landowner. These men who were hired last worked only one hour, they said, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them, Friend, I am not being unfair to you. Did you not agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I want to give the man who was hired last the same as I gave you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. And this is the word of the Lord. And now we'll get Johnson back to bring his message for the day. Can't wait. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Ben, for the reading of the word of God. Uh, let us pray. <clears throat> As children of God, we bring to you the needs of the world. We pray for those in society who are left standing in the marketplace, the long-term unemployed, those who have made mistakes in the past and who are no longer trusted. We pray for the relegated to the bottom of the pile in society and in church. We pray for those who are always the last to be remembered in their families, in their communities. We pray for, their com for the companies with the resources to be generous, with opportunities to help those on the fringes. We pray for the church and for the Christian people that they would draw in those whom others have sent away. We pray for all 
those who feel they haven't been fairly treated in life. Generous God, we entrust to you the first and the last, the rich and the poor, ourselves and all creation. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. This morning, I have decided to share with you on the theme, Is God Fair? Is God Fair? One day, a rich young ruler came enthusiastically running to Jesus and asked, What must I do to be saved? Jesus answered, Keep the law. This I have done for my youth, came the reply. Yet one thing do you lack, like, said Jesus. Go and sell all that you have and give it to the poor. Then come follow me. We are told that the young man walked away sorrowfully, for he had great wealth. Concluded the master, it will be hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. The disciples had been watching the dynamics of this happening and they were quite disturbed. Jewish tradition had always thought that God had especially blessed rich men and that is why he was rich. In their way of thinking, if a wealthy man could not receive salvation, then how could a poor man have any hope? They asked it of Jesus, who then can be saved? Jesus had just turned away a wealthy man, and in Jewish way of thinking, it doesn't make any sense. In fact, I'm not sure how many preachers would have the courage to turn away rich people from their churches. But it was Simon Peter who drew the question even more clearly into focus for us. He asked it what is on the mind of every one of us. Only we are too so sophisticated to it and too self-righteous to admit that we even think it. Peter didn't have any problem with that. He simply laid his cards out on the table. He said, Lord, we have given up everything, riches and all to follow you. What then shall we have? In other words, what's in this for us, Lord? How do we stand to profit? Where is the payoff? In response to Peter's question, Jesus told the story. It was the harvest time of the year. At 7 a.m., a wealth landowner went to the town square to hire laborers. Then about noon, he came back into town and hired two others. Towards the end of the day, there was still a need for more men. Perhaps this was a harvest of grapes that had to be brought in before the rains began. So at 5 p.m., the landowner went back into town and hired more laborers. At sunset, all of the men lined up to be paid. When they got their envelopes, lo and behold, all of them had been paid the same amount. The men who had worked 11 hours had been paid the same as the men who had worked one hour. This enraged the all-day workers. But the landowner replied, Do you begrudge me for generosity? Do you begrudge me for my generosity? And am I not allowed to do what I please with what belongs to me? This is where the question is, is God fair? This parable of Jesus must have fallen like a big thud upon the ears of his listeners. Here Simon Peter had asked Jesus a serious question and reply against a story that on the surface sounds quite ludicrous. A landowner that pays equal wages for men who do not work equal hours. Why? That's not the world's way. That runs counter to our whole system of justice and fair play. Who would work all day if you would simply wait till the last hour and then collect a day's pay? So the fact is that deep within us, we have a kind of sympathy for those grumbling laborers. The story that Jesus told turns all our whole economic system upside down. Simon must have been particularly offended by the story because it is obvious who he identifies with. He seems as himself as that laborer who has chosen early in the morning and worked all day. 
He doesn't comprehend why these John Latecomers should have preferential treatment. Now, don't get Simon Peter wrong. He is not opposed to favors being dispersed. He simply believes that if anyone should receive them, it should be those who worked in the fields. They be people like himself. We had worked first in the field today. Not anyone who comes later. So by telling this story, Jesus is informing Simon Peter that you'll get no more reward from discipleship than anyone else. So the person who comes late is just as important as the one who comes early. Think about Paul, who was also one of the disciples. He became one of the greatest disciples, but he came late. There is no such thing as ecclesiastical hierarchy. The bishops need forgiveness just as much as the newest convert needs forgiveness. It is the oldest condition in society. That's not fair. Remember Adam and Eve's two boys, Cain and Abel. They brought their offerings to God. For some reason, God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's offering. And what did Cain say? That's not fair. Cain thought in his heart and his resulting anger was the source of humanity's first murder. We hear it is not only among children, but among adults as well. That's not fair. That's one of the reasons we have lawyers and judges and if things get out of hand, police. It is the reason why some families are split after the reading of a will. It is why some people will always feel victimized in society. Life isn't fair. I'm not going to ask if any of you ever experienced inequality in the workplace. Would you believe that in some workplaces some people are paid more than others? Even though they may actually work less. But they are paid more. An old family circus caused comic strip shows the two boys of Jeff and Bill squabbling over the size of the slice of pie their mom has placed before them. They aren't the same. Jeff pops. Mom tries again. Even, even up the slices, still Jeff is upset. They still aren't the same. He whines. This time mom uses a ruler and absolutely proves that both size, both slices of pie are the exact same. But mom, Jeff complains, I want mine to be just bills only bigger. We are all tend to think we deserve a bigger slice of the pie. From the time we are little children, we are told that doing more is worth more. Did you get an allowance as a child? That weekly route for doing the chores that are your responsibility. My kids, my children, I give them allowances. If so, you probably had your allowance and the amount of work you did to earn that allowance go as up for your age and right. If a five-year-old gets a dollar for picking up their toys and clothes, if an eight-year-old gets five dollars for doing weekly homework, emptying the garbage, vacuuming the living room, then a 12-year-old should get considerably more for mowing the lawn, doing some laundry, watching younger siblings and cleaning the garage. Chores and allowance teach children that in this world's economy, we have to do work in order to receive our rewards. We want our children to learn and to live the adage, hard work pays off. That's what they want them to learn. That is why the parable in today's gospel text is unsettling. It is easy to identify with the grumbling guys who went sun up to sun down through the heat of the day and then watched in amazement as the sun slakers who went for one messly hour in the cool of the approaching evening, no less God paid a full day's wage. Of course, the full day worker expects more. Of course, the full day worker should get more. It is only fair. More work should equal more wages. Hard work pays off. But it doesn't not. It doesn't. Not in Jesus' story of the kingdom. Is it those work 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. got the same dust denarius that the 5 to 6 p.m. workers got? How is that fair? In your own thinking, how is that fair? 
It's not. But Jesus' parable is not about the human category of fairness. It is about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom that is only under God's rule. And God is not fair. Thank God, God is not fair. The God who rules heaven and earth is the God of justice and mercy, not the God of fair and equitable. In the hands of the God of justice, we know that we never need doubt God's word. Or be at the capricious whims of some all-powerful deity. An unflinching God of justice was a far cry from the scheming, dreaming, self-absorbed, mood gods and goodness of the pagan pantheon that ruled in the first century. But an unflinching God of justice leaves us all still in the marketplace, still out of the work, still out of lucky, still outside the vineyard that is God's kingdom at the eleventh hour. So our life training in the equality of human economics leads us to identify with those who labored in the vineyard all day long and cried foul when generosity is bestowed on the latecomers. So the truth is, we should be identifying with those marketplace mopies still hanging out with the hope that they will get a job at 5 p.m. Fallen humanity has no place to go at the close of the day. So the selection of workers in Jesus' parable is unpredictable as life itself. Although we may proudly assert that all people are born equal, there is no denying that we are not all equally born. Some of us are born into money and comfort, but many of us are not. Some of us are born with the grace and strength of athletes, but many of us are not. Some of us are born with physical disabilities that make every day a champion's challenge. Some of us have intellects that are strange and so, but many of us do not. Some of us have minds with holes and heads. Some of us get picked on that first round through the market, but many of us do not. In fact, any of one of us may suddenly find ourselves alone and unclaimed at some eleventh hour of our lives. And what do we say? That is why we are all eleventh hour people. Grateful for the enduring promises and presence of just God. But depend upon the compassion and generosity of a merciful God. But we still don't think that the whole thing is fair. And by our standards, it certainly isn't. But let me tell you something else that wasn't fair. It really wasn't fair that Jesus, a sinless man, go to the cross for your sins and for mine. Yet that is precisely what happened. The kingdom of God is another dimension, one that turns our world upside down. But that is precisely why Jesus was so free. For when he chose to go to the cross, for you and for me, he didn't first ask the question, what would he ask? Do we deserve it? And can we repay it? Because the answer to both questions is no. So this is a parable of the generosity of God. God pours out his grace fully and completely on all who receive it. We, we have labored in the vineyard as Christians for most of our lives would like to think that we will get extra measure of grace in return for our many years of service, but it will not happen. It cannot happen. So the Father's love is without limits. He pours out his grace without reservation and without regard to who deserves it and who does not. If that bothers you, get over it. If there are no limits on grace, if it exceeds everything we could ever hope for, everything we could ever expect, how can one person say he's got more than another? That's grace. And it's poured out in infinite quantities on you and me. It is totally an end. Whether we have labored for Christ for 50 years or 50 minutes, Think about the thief on the cross with Jesus Christ. Lord, remember me in the kingdom of God. And he said, today I'll be with you. Think about that. All we have to do is to receive God's grace, is to open our hearts to it. To some people it doesn't seem fair, but it is a fact. No wonder it's called amazing grace. 
It's amazing. Because it doesn't talk about the time we have spent in our churches. That's how many of us feel about our lives. We know that God's grace is free. We know that we did nothing to deserve it. But we also know it cost Christ his life. Amazing grace. It's not fair. It's not just. It's simply unbelievable, generous. And it is all ours for the taking today. That is what God is saying. Amen to that church. We need to understand the means of grace. We need to understand. That's why I find that a lot of people who have served in the church would not expect someone who has just come a new believer to be their leader. Because they measure with the standards of the world, not with the standards of grace. When Paul became a Christian, he said he didn't even go to ask those who were disciples before him. He just started ministering, going out to Damascus to preach the word of God. That is what grace means. So I'm saying this to you. When we receive Christ, more than 20 years ago, more than 50 years ago, and someone received Christ today, we are the same in the kingdom of God. May God bless you for listening to this message. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, gracious God, that you have worked for each of us to do in the furtherance of your kingdom. Grant us each the integrity to do our work to the best of our ability rather than compare ourselves with others and to rejoice that with you all are needed and all are valued in your sight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask you to take your offering and um, bring your offering so that we can pray for it. You will put it aside if you want, and if you've got a phone, you can make an electronic transfer uh, from your electronic gadgets, phones, your computers. So just hold your mind right now as I pray with you. Father, we bring our offering to you. We thank you so much for the love you've shown to us. We thank you so much, Lord Jesus Christ, that in the kingdom of heaven, it's not about the number of years that we have saved you. It's about our relationship with you. Thank you for reminding us so that wherever we are, we know that we are not the only ones. For he said the first shall be the last, and the last shall become the first. Bless this offering, Lord Jesus Christ, for the furtherance of your gospel in the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us receive grace. May the generosity of God challenge and inspire you to include all in your prayers. Invite all to your table and ensure that all are treated with dignity, fairness, and respect. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen.